conversation. All right. Good evening, everybody. There we go. I believe we are live. I think we're live. Uh, I am coming to you tonight on location from a secret underground bunker. Um, not really, but I'm not in studio, as you can tell. And uh, somebody let me know if you can see me and hear me, because uh, it's a little bit of a different setup. I'm not even on my own laptop. I see Deborah Lester and Daniela and Denise uh, and others. So somebody tell me if you can see me. And uh, there we go. Okay. We see you and hear you. Fantastic. Hey, everybody. Mike Wolf in Orchard Park. Mike Wolf is doing such an incredible job with our young adults. We're super proud of him. Denise, Trisha Miller is still there in South Florida. Trisha, you're you're making, you're letting this vacation last for a long time. David Nieto, the uh, president and owner of Living Springs Water, a fantastic fresh water company. If you're anywhere in the tri-state area, he's based in New Jersey, but they service the entire tri-state area. And uh, great to see you, Carol Moreau, June Brooks from Bolingbrook, Illinois, Kristen Anderson Rains from Alabama. And uh, just folks in from everywhere. All right. Uh, all right, uh, Terry, Josh is out there. Pastor Josh Ogle, who we just are so proud of. Uh, we, we, uh, Josh is beautiful family. Um, they're just such an incredible kingdom family. And we're so proud of them out there. So, uh, hi, mom. Good to see you, mom. <laughs> Love you. Miss you, mom. Wilmington, Delaware is with us. David Krause. You know, Dave, seeing David Krause on makes me think, everybody. Um, I'd like us to have a, a, a little meetup in the near future to talk about Shabbat. Because increasingly, more and more Christians are honoring and keeping Shabbat in, in some way. And um, we want to see how we can facilitate that and grow that and connect to that movement. And uh, so uh, we're going to be talking more about that. Joseph Timothy McBride, glad to know the classes have started back up. Yeah, there's David Nieto's uh, livingspringwaterllc.com for all your water needs in the tri-state area. Pastor Craig Pridgen, my brother. I love you, Pastor Craig. God bless you, sir. One of the greatest preachers in America today. Pastor Craig Pridgen, you need to tune in and uh, to listen to this man of God speak. Well, uh, I'm with my boys. We're on vacation. We're in New York City today and uh, having a fantastic time. And uh, God is good all the time. And so we've come together. Uh, Oy vey, what happened? Did something happen? I don't know that anything happened. Is everything all right? Somebody let me know that you can still see me. All right. Um, uh, we come together as we do week after week to study the word of God. I love this. And I'm telling you, the, the discipline and the rhythm and the community of studying the word of God together uh, is just fantastic. And we've learned this from the Jewish people. Torah Tuesdays, folks, if you were on Tuesday... We had a record high number on Tuesday. We had over 100 people aggregate in the room live. And then, of course, it, it gets downloaded and people share it, et cetera. Um, uh, this is growing. This, this, this Jerusalem-centered Christianity is growing. And uh, we're so excited to have you here. If you're new tonight, if it's your first time, type in first time so that we can greet you. Maura Wall is here from New Holland, Pennsylvania, and uh, Sid and Ruth Cohen are here. What a great group. We've got a fantastic group tonight. All right, everybody, um, turning your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, we're going to go to chapter 21. I am so excited to have tonight with us um, a man, you get around this, this rabbi and you just sense uh, his love for truth 
his love for um, the, the culture that the word of God calls us to. Uh, the word of God consistently draws us to our best selves, to our highest selves. Well, look at all these first timers. Oh my goodness. Kaylin McAllen, first time. Kristen Anderson Rains, first time. Kevin Robinson, first time. Wow. Fantastic. All these first timers. Jerusalem Centered Christianity is the only authentic faith. That is from Trisha Miller, a PhD. That's an intense statement, beloved, but it's probably true. Much of modern uh, Western Christianity is, is an aberration from anything that Jesus or the Apostle Paul or the first century church would have understood. So how do we get back to the roots of our faith? We are so excited tonight to welcome all the way from Hollywood, California, Rabbi David Barron. He is the Rabbi of Temple of the Arts Synagogue. And, uh, Rabbi Barron, we are thrilled to have you. And if we can bring the rabbi in, that would be awesome. Do I need to do anything on that? Uh, we've got this. Uh... There he is. Okay, there he is. There you are, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. I want to thank you for welcoming me to this wonderful program. I've been here before, and I'm really honored to be here with you, Bishop Stearns. And I want to take a minute to offer a thanks to God for you and the work you do in uniting our people. Our nation needs unifiers, not dividers. And you you take the lead on that. And, and I want to commend you and bless you for all, your, all the work you do. Well, Rabbi, you're, you're very, very kind. And, uh, you know, for all of our listeners and, and participants tonight, a funny story is that Rabbi and I first met the very, very first time in Washington, D.C. at an enormous gathering. I think there must have been, Rabbi, at least 5,000 people there, yes. maybe more. It was huge. And um, Rabbi had been invited to give the invocation for the evening, and I had been invited to sing the national anthem. That's correct. Yeah. And we met backstage, <laughs> and it was a massive production. And we're kind of quickly saying hello to each other, and and trying to be polite with each other before we walk it out onto this major platform. Uh, and then as you know, these things are beshared, right? There's no, co we don't believe in coincidences. There's no coincidences in God. Uh, and so that little seed of relationship that was planted that night, uh, a few years later when we really got connected yes, um, yes. was just wonderful. So folks, you are in for a special night. Rabbi is one of our favorites here. I think this is second or third time with us. Yes. We're so thrilled to have him. But Rabbi, before you start, um, we know that we're in the month of Elul. Yes. This is a very special month. This is the month of the year that every single day the shofar is blown, every single day during the lul. Correct. We are awakening our hearts. Uh, it's the day that the king is in the field. It's the day that Hashem, the Lord, draws near to his people in preparation for the high holy days. Uh, we're coming up to the 10 days of awe, days of repentance, days of our heart. We, we, take, eva we take evaluation of our heart, etc., so this is a very, very um, spiritual season of, of, the, of the holy calendar, the sacred calendar. But Rabbi, speak to us because in a, in, you're going to have your special lectures. And I can't think of anyone better for everyone to tune into for the Rosh Hashanah lecture and these various other lectures. Uh, tell us a little bit about how people can tune in to your upcoming High Holy Days messages. Well, thank you. Um, we'll be conducting live services. We're one of only a few synagogues in the country that are going to do live services, COVID compliant, but also live stream. And we want people to join the templelivestream.com and tune in on September 6th and 7th for Rosh Hashanah and September 15 and 16 for Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, it's a very powerful service. It mm -hmm. replicates many of the beautiful components of the ancient holy temple. And it involves opening your heart to forgiveness, which for some of us is one of the hardest things to do, to mm -hmm. forgive someone who's injured us or hurt us. 
So this is a powerful time. It's a window of opportunity to reset the DNA for a new year and not carry old grudges and anger and animosity into the new year. And how do we do that? Well, you can't run a marathon by waking up one morning, putting on your running shorts and go run the marathon. You have to be in training. So this month of Elul is our training period for beginning to hear the sound of the ram's horn, which is the call to repentance, to begin to focus and think about what we can do to correct mistakes and sins of the past, to realign with family members that we may have become alienated from, send an email or a message and say, hey, let's put the past behind, see if we can build a present and a future together. So, so it's a powerful time in the Jewish year. And as I said, I, I bring, I do what I guess is for me, something I've loved doing. I give a living sermon. So if I'm gonna talk about a woman uh, who stood up for women's rights in Iran at the risk of her own life, instead of telling you about her, I'm bringing her. So Masi Alinejad is gonna be one of my guests on Yom Kippur. Incredible. And she'll be available to you in the templelivestream.com. And she's gonna tell the story of what she did. She had young women in Iran hold their face up to the camera and turn their head from their phone and rip off the Shadur. And hundreds of thousands of Iranian women said, no, we protest against the mullahs and the repressive nature of Sharia law. And uh, she had to flee for her life and come to the United States. And we're very honored. She's gonna be one of my guests as an exemplar of heroism and standing up to, to the abuse of women, which is something we're seeing today in Afghanistan the tragedy of, of Afghanistan. Well, Rabbi, uh, these are times that call for great bravery. These are times that call for great courage. Uh, and we need to begin to demonstrate that in America. Um, and we're seeing uh, a travesty of epic proportions in Afghanistan. And, you know, so often, Rabbi, it's mind blowing when you really start following the Parsha or the parshot is it? Is it plural parshot? Parshiot, uh, yeah. Uh, parshiot. It's amazing. It's uncanny how what comes up in the weekly portion will align with what is happening in the global headline. It's amazing, isn't time it? Time after time after time. So everybody, as we go tonight to Deuteronomy chapter 21, Rabbi, one of the things dealt with in tonight's Parsha is if Israel finds itself in a moment of war and <clears throat> finds themselves, you know, the, the war, the spoils of war, as it were, there's there's the slaves that they take or the uh, the women or the, these, how do you handle uh, the after a war in an ethical way? Well, and that, I, yeah. that, that's, that's, you know, what we're dealing with here. And of course, what we're, what we're facing, the evil that we're seeing from the Taliban in Afghanistan, is is heartbreaking, and and I, I I don't want to be overly political, but you know America's complicitness in 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 how in, in in the way that we've left behind our our friends there is just it's it's so very very painful. But let's start there tonight, Rabbi. What did Hashem teach us um, about treating even our enemies ethically? Uh, even those that were in a spoil of war? And, and how does that apply to us today? Well, the Torah respects every human being and says that even an enemy soldier fallen in battle has to be buried. You can't leave their body out to decay. Um, wow. and, and the opening words of the Torah portion are, when you go forth, say lamil chama, to do battle against your enemy, oivecha. Um, and you see a beautiful woman, and you want to take her. And remember, that's human nature. Soldiers in the heat of battle, to the victor go the spoils. They want to grab and sure. enjoy the spoils of war, especially in the heat of battle. But the Torah says, no, stop. You can't do that. You have to allow that woman to mourn any of her male relatives killed in battle. Wow. She has to cut her hair, trim her nails. And if you still desire her after her mourning period, you may bring her to your home and make her your wife. So it takes something that's instinctive and natural in human beings in the heat of battle to want to take all the spoils of war, the rape and pillage we see that happens in so many different situations and says, no, you've got to stop. 
and you've got to commit yourself to a higher standard of conduct. And, and that's a powerful lesson that goes against human nature. And when we think about these young girls now that are being taken by the Taliban to be sex slaves or to be child brides, it's just horrific. And we have to recognize that it's our responsibility to demand a higher standard and not to remain silent. The end of the Torah portion speaks about monstrous evil. It says, remember what the Amalekites did to you when you wandered in the wilderness. Zahor et asher asalacha amalek. It, the Amalekites attacked the rear guard of the Israelite caravan. Right. Who was in the rear guard? The nursing women with their babies, the old men and women who couldn't keep up with the pace of travel. They were in the rear guard and the Amalekites attacked the most vulnerable, the weakest. And that's why we command ourselves to erase and blot out the memory of what the Amalekites did, because that cruelty is going to repeat itself in future generations. And it's our duty to blot out the memory of that kind of evil and the recognition of that evil. So I, I think the Torah portion teaches us a powerful lesson that relates to today's events unfolding in Afghanistan. And it is yes. truly a, an avoidable tragedy. It didn't have to happen this way. And um, the, the standards that should have been demanded of the Taliban were not demanded. And now we're going to see history repeat itself, that the conduct they've displayed in the past, executions, um, imposition of severe Sharia law, it's going to repeat itself. And, and that's a tragedy for the people, especially the women uh, of Afghanistan. And um, I think all of us have a responsibility to stand up to that, and, and I hope we will. Um, the Torah reading also contains some really interesting commandments that uh, I'd like to touch on for just a minute, if I may. Well, we're gonna go, yeah, we're going to go there in one second, Rabbi. Before we do, everybody, we're speaking with uh, Rabbi David Barron from Temple of the Arts in Hollywood, California. Uh, just an incredible teacher, an incredible human being. I want you all to tune in at templelivestream.com, and we have it in the comments section. Uh, all of the, just take a picture of it right there. All of the dates and times are there. Remember that he's on West Coast time, Pacific time. But everybody, this is your time to do it. You've got one job tonight. You know what it is. I need you to hit the share button right now, if you would, everybody. Hit the share button. Uh, and let's continue to spread the word of Jerusalem-based Christianity. We had several new people on tonight. Here's LaVon signing in from Arizona, uh, who is with us. Roseanne from Blue Mountain is here. Um, but if, if you could all hit the share button as quickly as possible so we can continue to um, um, uh, fill the room up. I do want to mention just briefly also be looking. I released a special article this week called uh, Don't Trust Overly Confident Theologians. So fi find that article, uh, everyone. And you should have added, or generals. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Uh, so thank you, Laverne. Sh it, it, yeah, if you've shared, just type in I've shared, and let's get that word passed out. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 21 through chapter 25, Kititze. And it opens with this discussion of out of the heat of battle, how do you make sure that we are uh, still treating ethically uh, the enemy, you know, the spoils of war? And we see this uh, horrible acting out that's happening right now from the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, Rabbi, take us deeper now into this Parsha uh, and bring us into some of these core principles. Well, the Torah here speaks about a number of different kinds of laws related to family relationships, sexual relationships. It also deals with marriage. But I love a couple of the little gems that are here. One of them is you should not muzzle an ox uh, that is working. And, and the idea is that you don't subject cruelty to an animal, that you treat God's creatures, human beings, of course, first, and animals with kindness and compassion. And also there's a law in the Torah about building a, a guardrail on the roof of your house. You know, there's this rooftop dining that occurs, right. especially in the ancient Middle East. And even today, people go up on their roof on a hot summer's evening, right. and cool, cool off. They may have a couple of wine, uh, glasses of wine too many, 
and fall off the roof and injure right. themselves or God forbid get killed. So the Torah says you must build a parapet, a, a guardrail around the roof of your house. So think about that. The Torah is even teaching us laws of safety and care for one another under these circumstances. And I think these are great examples of the Torah's focus on interpersonal relationships. This, so can't, this can't just be about our relationship with God, God also wants us to focus on our relationship with one another. And in that way, we express the divine or the godly in our lives. So for me, that's uh, another important component of this Torah reading. Remember, these are the last farewell speeches of Moses to the children of Israel before they enter the promised land. And he's trying to remind them of their history and remind them of their commitment to each other and how they treat one another and how they behave in battle. Let me just come back to one important point in Israel. In the Israeli army today, there is a rule called purity of weapons, taharat haneshek. You cannot use your weapon only in battle. You can't use it against civilians. That is verboten, it's forbidden. And so there are very strict rules and you can be prosecuted if you're excessive in the use of your force against civilians. So that's a lesson we're taught and our, our armed forces are taught this as well that you have to be very careful and considerate of the civilian population. And you know, when I think about the civilian population in Afghanistan, so many of them were interpreters and helped the American forces there to try and hold back or root out Al Qaeda and the Taliban. You have to show compassion and understanding for them as well. Well, it's so, it's so critical. And we were speaking just recently about the ethical training that the Israeli army goes through. Uh, you know, what other army uh, drops leaflets warning, uh, you know, civilians that there's bombs coming there? You know, uh, I mean, I Israel just goes over the top in its commitment. It's not perfect. There's, there's mistakes that happen. We understand perfect. that. But this commitment to being an ethical um, army and, you know, Rabbi, a few years ago, I wrote a book and I, I talked about the twin threats that are facing our generation. And uh, post 9-11, we focused so much on militant Islam. And of course, we're seeing that again today now in Afghanistan. That's very much on our minds. Also in Iran, we're seeing this. But I believe equally threatening and perhaps in some insidious way, even more threatening, is a militant secularism. I'm not just talking about a general agnosticism. I'm talking about uh, an atheism that says, I don't believe in God, and I'm not going to let you believe in God either. Hmm. And, and there really becomes this thought police that try to exclude and remove the knowledge of God uh, from, uh, you know, from the public square. And this is what we're facing right now in society. I mean, you can, you can have any belief, any crazy notion you want, but if you, if you're someone who believes, if you're someone who believes in this book, you know, you're dangerous. <laughs> you're, you're dangerous if you believe in this, in this book, the Bible. And uh, so um, that's right, David. It was, it was, I felt like God told me the greater threat was, was secularism because without the, without the safeguard that the word of God gives us, the word of God, you said, Rabbi, earlier, it calls us to a higher place. It calls us to a higher standard. It reminds us how we should act and how we should be. And, uh, and this is why the study of the word is so very important. I'll tell you, um, my great concern is for our American future. Those of us who are rooted in the Bible and rooted in Judeo-Christian values, uh, we see them being challenged and often discarded in the name of woke sensitivities, in the name of uh, claiming that uh, attacking you right away and canceling you if your opinion or point of view is different or if you hearken back to biblical principles and the way you conduct your life. And to me, we have to stand up to this. We, as people of faith, are called upon to stand up. 
and take, take a stand against this cancel culture, against this culture which will immediately label someone as a racist or, or uh, and it's so interesting because uh, the people who are often behind these movements have an, a Marxist undertone. And if you know the principles of Marxism, religion is the opiate of the masses. So there's a condemnation of religious perspective, of religious adherence. And I think that all of us have to open our eyes to see that and know that people who will often attack are attacking you for things that they are personally violating. So uh, the cancel culture ultimately will cancel itself if enough people of good conscience will stand up to it. And we're starting to see that happen in school boards, in local elections, where people are saying, no, I don't want to be uh, told that I'm a racist or I'm filled with Right. Uh, a prejudice that I've never felt in my life. I've never had this prejudice. Why am I being told that I have it? And oh, if you don't have it, then you don't know you have it. That's even worse. So, I mean, it's so absurd. The construct is, is so uh, um, absurd on its face. And yet it's a way of manipulating and controlling thought. And for us, freedom Absolutely. is so essential. Freedom of faith. America was founded on freedom of religion, freedom of speech. These are the freedoms that we learn from the Torah, from the Bible, and they inform our lives. And we have to stand up for them as men and women of faith. And I want to encourage everyone online right now. I mean, this is a time to let your voice be heard. And, and it seems to me that the, the very front lines, and, and I would encourage folks, you're not, you're not going to make a huge difference on social media. I mean, go for it, but it's, it's become such a, an echo chamber. But I'll tell you where you can make a difference, folks, is in your local school board meeting. Get connected to your local school board. Find out what's being taught. To Those are your tax dollars that are funding uh, that educational system. Be present. Show up. Become a part of that conversation. You know, uh, Jesus taught us in the Christian Bible that we're called to be salt and light. Uh, salt, not just as seasoning, but salt in Jesus' time was a preservative. You would pack meat and you'd pack things in salt and it would be preserved from, from going bad. We're called to be the preservatives of society. We're called to be those who bring conscience, who bring light, who bring um, a higher perspective. So I really want to encourage us that we've got to begin to speak out more as Rabbi is encouraging us um, to do. Rabbi, our time constantly slips away so fast. We've got time for about one or two more core thoughts for uh, from you uh, from this Parsha. So um, at the end of the reading, it commands us to remember the evil of the Amalekites and not to forget. And the rabbis asked the question, well, you told me to remember, why are you adding not to forget? And the reason is because, as, as one philosopher put it, those who do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. That's right. But also because it's human nature. It's mm -hmm. human nature. You put things out of your mind and maybe not in a day or a week or a month, but maybe in a year you begin to forget those lessons. And I have to say, I feel that many of us, and, and I'm guilty of this myself, Americans have been asleep at the wheel. A lot of parents whose kids are now learning online or were in the past COVID year are seeing what their children are studying. That's they're right. seeing the 1619 curriculum being taught and they're in shock. Right. And that's because we forgot. We forgot how powerful the education system is in shaping minds. That's Both right in elementary school, all the way through the college campus. And we can be asleep no more. We're commanded yes. to, to remember and not to forget. And to me, both of those are part of the issue of living a life that is informed by our values and one that we constantly remind ourselves of. So the study of the Bible, of the Torah, is something we continuously do each year. We keep reading and rereading it and gaining new insights because it informs us on how to live our lives, lives of faith, lives of value, lives of responsibility for one another and for the next generation. Thank you, Sonia, for putting in the uh, the verse there. Sonia's got the verse in there from, from Mark. 
Uh, Rabbi, you know, you're sounding like a Pentecostal preacher tonight. <laughs> but <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you something about salt. This is a very interesting curiosity, which I didn't know, but I heard okay. about salt being a preservative, what you were talking about, um, Bishop Robert. So yeah. there's a, a very favorite kind of Jewish delicatessen meat called corned beef. Sure. And everyone used to ask, well, where did the term corned beef come from? It has nothing to do with corn. It's, it's right. a, sliced, a sliced form of beef that makes deli sandwiches. And the reason is because to preserve it before refrigeration, they would keep it in salt and the salt would form little kernels on top that look like corn. And that's where the term corned beef <laughs> Comes go. from so now you learned something that I just learned a couple of weeks ago <laughs> about the preservative. But there you we, go. we are God's preservatives. We are the ones who will preserve the teaching, and so we have to take a lead in this. But Rabbi, you just said something there toward the end that I want to highlight as we as we start to wind down, and and that is you talked about the power of remembrance, and and I really want to challenge my Christian brothers and sisters on the broadcast tonight. And we always, we always have our Jewish friends who join in as well. But I want to speak specifically to my Christian brothers and sisters because, unfortunately, the narrative that we've been told too often is that, oh, the Jews with all of their good deeds, you know, they, they think that that's going to gain them salvation. And we look at the various aspects of Judaism uh, like the mezuzah on the door, that you bless the mezuzah on the door, or the wearing of the kippah, or the various blessings that you recite throughout the day. And I, I can't, I think it might have been Mark Gerson, or it might have been Rabbi Penny Dunner, but one of our guests said this to us. They said, Judaism is a religion of remembrance. We put all of these things in front of us to remind us to bring God into every moment of our lives, which is why there are blessings for each thing. And, and it's such a, 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 you know, you're gonna light the candles and all of these things become these multi-sensory um, reminders. And, and so I wanna challenge my Christian brothers and sisters uh, because too often we can say, oh, well, you know, we don't, we're not under the law and we don't we don't have to do all those good deeds. Well, it's not about those it's not about God loving us because we do good deeds or us earning favor with God because we do good deeds. It's about the fact that we bring we consciously bring God into every day of our lives. Some Jewish men wear wear tzitzit. They wear the they wear the tassel. The fringes, yeah. yeah. The fringes, the, the tzitzit, the, the, the tassels on the garment. All of these things become those things that just point us uh, heavenward. And we've never needed a day more than today to be reminded to look to God, to look to his light, to look to his counsel, to look to his word. And so that is why I think these weekly studies are so incredibly important. And we've seen again tonight how the Parsha written 4,000 years ago, 5,000, is, is absolutely as, as, as relevant for us today. And we call it, uh, Bishop Robert, a constellation of mitzvot, of commandments. There's a whole constellation of commandments. We might not fulfill every single one of them. One of them in this week's reading is to make sure you pay a laborer or somebody working for you on time that same day. Don't allow it to go to the next day because that person may depend on right. their survival for that income. And so it's so important that, that this constellation of commandments makes us better people. Yeah, there are a few of us who are very highly evolved spiritual human beings, but most of us need the hardware. We need the equipment to help us fulfill God's mission for us, which is to be a light to all of humanity. So I hope I hope that's something we can take to heart. And I hope your viewers will join me on the Jewish New Year and on the we're here the shofar, the ram's horn, awakening our consciousness. On Yom Kippur, we will meet my very special guests who are part of my living sermon. And they just need to go to templelivestream.com uh, at 8 p.m. 
on the evening of the eve of Rosh Hashanah, September 6th, then 10 a.m. on the 7th, and then the following week on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, and that's again at 8 p.m. on September 15th and at 10 a.m. Pacific time on September 16th. I welcome all of the viewers of this program to, to come and join that live stream if they'd like to experience what the Jewish people engage in during these holy days of penitence. And uh, again, thank you to Ashley and Dina and the team. They've got it again in the comments. So it's run through the comments section several times, folks. You. You've got that there. And Rabbi, for folks to find you on social, how do they connect with you to follow you? So um, I'm on social. I've been working on a new spiritual program, but they can just go to Rabbi David Barron and uh, you'll find me on there and um, uh, both on, on uh, Instagram and uh, you can follow on our website, templeofthearts.org, where my weekly Torah talk is found. I do a five-minute Torah talk on the portion each week because it's so important that we have a Bible in our home and it just doesn't have a place on a shelf. It opens, we Beautiful. open it, we open it to draw Beautiful. wisdom from it. And I have to tell you something that never ceases to amaze me. When a child sees a mom or dad or grandparent open that Bible and read a verse, they're fascinated by that. You engage them immediately and they see it's important to you and it transfers, becomes important to them as well. So having the word, reading the word, living by the word is yes. all part of our mission as people of faith. And, and so many ways that we can, core, I know my, my practice with my sons, you know, we read the proverb of the day. There's 31 proverbs, so 31 days in the month, and, and we read the proverb corresponding to the day. We do that every day. And uh, and uh, it's so important to incorporate these things into our lives. And Rabbi, you've helped us tonight. You've taken us through ki titze, ki tates, no, tetze. Tetze. And what does that mean literally, Rabbi? As you go forth into battle, ki tetze la mil chama, as you go forth into battle, upon your enemy. Here are the rules of conduct in a time of war. And they relate to not taking advantage of the civilian population of the women, which right. is the exact opposite of what we see happening before our eyes in Afghanistan. So I'd like to offer a prayer for the men and women. Yes. The innocent men and women of Afghanistan. And uh, we want to pray for them, that God watch over and protect them. And we want to pray for the men and women of our armed forces who spent so much blood and sweat to help those people in Afghanistan. We thank them for their sacrifice and that through their actions, they've prevented another 9-11, which is coming up on us very soon, the 20th anniversary. Dear God, watch over and protect them as they've protected us and grant them healing as we send them our love and our energy. For good. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. What a beautiful night we've had. What a great crowd we've had. You've been in from all over the country, including many, many first time folks. And it's just been absolutely fantastic. We made it work with the technology. We're so grateful to the production team back in Buffalo. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Danny. And, uh, and thank you, all of my partners. Eagles Wings family, we are together in this. Uh, and it's an exciting time. It's not an easy moment in history, but it's an exciting moment in history to be a person of faith and to walk in bravery, to walk in courage, to walk in the word of God, to be awake, to be involved. Don't pray only, pray, but then act. Get involved and, uh, and stay connected. And tune in to Rabbi's High Holy Day messages. They're going to bless you. And remember, we're in Elul. The king is in the field. We're getting our hearts ready for that place of encountering him in a fresh way. Rabbi, thank you so much for being with us. You're one of our favorites. It's great to have had you again tonight. Thank you. Shalom to you and all your viewers. Thank you. God's peace. Shalom, Rabbi. God bless Amen. everyone. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem.